Hello fellow Scratchers, I'm Griff Patch and today, wow, today we are going to be doing some quite revolutionary Scratch coding. This is episode 17 of the Tile Scrolling Platformer series, but some of the ideas we will be using today have possibly not been seen before. Maybe they have, but well, let me know, because we are adding the green Koopa Troopers, and getting their shells to collide with other enemy clones. Well, I hope you've got your brains all fluffed up and ready to absorb. I am so excited. Let's get scratching. Hopefully you caught episode 16, where we introduced the piranha plant. If so, you've probably got a good sense of how we're going to begin adding Koopas. Click into the enemy sprite. Checking out the costumes, we can see Cooper is sitting here at costume 5. Yeah, 5 and 6. We'll need these numbers later, but our first job is to copy the first Cooper costume into the tile sprite. This will allow us to place it in the level editor. OK, cool. Cooper has a tile number of 69. Now often, we need to tweak the position of the costume in the editor to make it display in a sensible position. If we zoom right out, select the entire costume by pressing Ctrl A, or just drag a box around it, and then press the up arrow key four times. That should do it. There, that's the costume done. Now we need to map an editor key to it. Click into the editor sprite and bring up the tile key map list. Remembering Cooper is tile costume 69, we can scroll right down and enter a 9 at item 69. Yeah, all the enemy tiles are being mapped to the number key 9, and Cooper is no different. Do remember to click out to another list row to ensure Scratch saves your last edit. OK, hide the list. Last step before we can test is to go into the enemy sprite and find the define spawn type custom block. Each enemy tile is spawned from here, so duplicate one of these if blocks and check for a tile type of. 69. We can give the sprite a unique name. Cooper will do. What was our enemy costume number? 5. OK, enter a costume of 5. And then for the size, width is still 16, and height, that's 24. Taller than the Gumba, but shorter than a piranha plant. Super! That's the minimum we need to do to get the enemy to appear in the game. So let's run the project. Right, level editor with the zero key, and then press 9 until we find Koopa. There they are. Excellent. I'm going to pop one right up here. No reason why. I'm always glad to see the enemy appear though when I click the button. Phew! And if I start the game by pressing 0, there they remain in place. This is great news. The default action of an enemy is to stay still and turn to face the player. We can't kill them, and they can't do anything to us either. Our next goal then is to get Cooper walking around. The good news is that Cooper Trooper's basic movement is identical to Gumba's, so we can reuse lots of code. Find with me the When I Receive Move Enemy script. This script is getting quite long. It contains many ifs to handle the different enemy types. I'm going to duplicate the Gumba if and put it on the end of the script. I guess we could have just used an OR instead now that I think about it, but never mind. Change the type check from Gumba to Koopa. So let's see what this tick Gumba script does. So we have the movement in the X and Y, and then we set the costume. Ah, OK. So this costume 2 is Gumba's initial costume number. We can't use this for Koopa. They have a different root costume number. I'm going to have to introduce a new variable to help us out. Name it root costume for this sprite only. Now, where we had this costume to, stuff in the root costume variable. We just need to ensure we've set this variable to 2 for Gumbas and 5 for Coopers then. If we look at the define spawn type custom block, you can see when we spawn Gumbas using set type, we are passing in a costume 2 here. Equally, Coopers already have a costume 5, so that sounds promising. Scroll down to the define set type script below. Here. Here we are setting costume to this value, so we already had a variable set to the correct value. That's true, but it doesn't stay on that number for very long and gets changed as we animate the sprite. So now we can set 
root costume to costume as well. Great, in which case let's give that a test to see whether the setting the root costume was enough. Oh yes, here they come. Let me jump on them. Oh, did you see that? When they die, they transform into a squished Goomba. Hmm. Let's add another one down here. Oh, now did you see that? The Koopa down there it didn't try to walk under the block. He was too big. That's cool. So when a Koopa is stamped on, they obviously shouldn't be turning into Goombas. No. They should instead be retreating back into their shells. This is a problem, because we don't have any Koopa shells in our enemy costumes. Hmm. But don't worry, I have them all prepared for you, so save your project now and come and find my tile scrolling tutorial asset project. There's a link to it under the video if you can't find it. Click into the enemy sprite and check out these super new costumes. Yeah, we have the green and red Koopa shells. Awesome. Just backpack the entire enemy sprite. That would be the easiest way to go. Now come back to your tile scrolling project and we can copy the backpacked sprites in. It appears magically as enemy 2 and that's fine, so I can copy the new costumes into my enemy sprite starting at 26 and working all the way up to 33. Excellent work. I'll just double check the costumes are present. Yep so we can delete the enemy 2 sprite to tidy things up. So when Koopa is stamped on, they currently show a squished Goomba costume. Let's find out why. In the enemy sprite, find the defined tick Goomba script, since both Goomba and Koopa are using this. Now look further down, here is the touching Mario block. And well, there you go. This is what causes the squished Goomba to always appear. We need to behave differently for Goombas and Koopas. So use an if else block and check if type equals Goomba. Now only the set type and the set costume are specific to Goombas. Let's take the rest outside the if. The add to particles can go below, the bounce player can go above. As we said, type and costume, these are Goomba specific. Put those into the if and frame, that can go above. Good. This script can now be returned to where it came from under the point direction here. So Goomba should still work as before. Let's fix up Koopa and switch him to his shell form. I'll duplicate the if else block, stripping off those list blocks. And we check for a type of, yep, Koopa. Okay, so now things get interesting. We need to make up a new type for the shells. Let's have a type of Koopa shell. Now for the costume. We should look that up again. Yeah, it's 26 for the first green Koopa shell. Set costume then to 26. Ah, but hold on. It will make sense to set the root costume now so that we can handle the red shells later on. One more thing we should do is to set the height variable to 15. A Koopa shell is distinctively shorter than a Koopa Troopa. Nice, 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 we're getting somewhere. We have changed the sprite from a Koopa to a so-called Koopa shell, but our project does not know how to handle such an enemy type yet. We must scroll to the when I receive move enemy script. And scrolling down again, duplicate another if script for our new Koopa shell type. But no tick Goomba script for this one. The movement is a bit more customised. Make a new block, naming it Tick Shell. Run without screen refresh. And pop it under our new if. OK, all I want to do is test that things are working, so let's muddle together a simple script. Set costume to the root costume we set up a moment ago. We could do with some gravity, so change speed y by minus 1. And then we use the move sprite y block to do the job. Nice. That should be enough to let us test that the transition to the Cooper shell works as planned. So here we go. And squish. 
Yeah, that is really satisfying. The transition worked great. Let's just try that again. Put some more enemies on the level. And jump on them all. Haha, <laughs> take that. Great. So, what is missing? It's the ability to walk into a shell and have it spin off away from you. Now, all the interactions are quite straightforward. We just need to be methodical. First consideration. When Cooper becomes a shell, we want a small delay before they can be kicked. We'll give them three frame ticks. If frame is less than three, changing frame by one, and then stopping this script. That deals with that. Right then, if we got here and frame is still three, then this is a stationary shell. So if the shell is not touching Mario, then again, stop this script. There's nothing we need to do. We're waiting for Mario to come along. But if we are touching Mario, it's business time. What direction do we want to send this shell off in? If else, when Mario's X is less than the shell's X, then Mario should kick the shell off to the right. So set direction to 90. In the else, set direction to minus 90 to kick the shell left. Okay then, we are off. This shell should be animating. We want quite a fast animation, so let's change frame by perhaps uh, 0 0.5. That will update the costume every other frame. Next, we need to get the shell moving. How about we set speed x to uh, direction divided by 9. Now since direction is 90 or minus 90, that would be a speed of 10 or minus 10. The move sprite x block will then move it. So we should be in a place to give it a test. Green flag. And dispatch a Koopa. And kick. Wow, look at that shell go. The move sprite x is doing a great job moving the shell and bouncing it off the walls too. Hey, we forgot to add the change of costume animation. We're already changing frame by 0 0.5. And all we need is to change the costume because we have already set costume to the base costume up here. So we now change costume by, and we'll use a floor to account for the half frame increments. And then a mod of the frame to cycle through the four costumes. You can see each shell has four costumes in its animation loop. Let's see that in action. And there we go. A spinning shell. I'm very pleased with that. I just wish it would do some damage to those enemies down there with it. But I guess, first off, let's do the easier job and get it to do damage to Mario. We can borrow some Goomba's scripts for this. Find the defined tick Goomba. And scroll down to find the touching Mario check. Duplicate everything from the paint sprite down and bring it safely back down to the tick shell script. I'm going to pop it at the end here. This script handles both Mario jumping on the enemy sprite and being killed by it. So we do need to handle both of these with a spinning shell as they are deadly to touch, but can be stomped on to stop them spinning. The first if is for when we jump on the Koopa shell. Let's tidy it up. Get rid of the point in direction block and oh wow, we can scrap the entirety of this if block and below. Goodbye. That's a lot simpler looking. Let's give it a test. We get the shell spinning. And now I just need it to hit me. Oh, oh gosh, I accidentally stamped on it. Well, that's good in that it shows that that works too. Oh, except jumping on it again seems a little off there. Boom, that's it. Quite capable of putting an end to one of my lives. That's good. Let's see that jumping glitch again. Um, bounce, bounce, bounce. Well, that's awkward. Not to worry, I know what it is. 
When we touch a shell and begin it moving for the first time, we don't have any cooldown time before a second touch can stop it moving again. Let's address that by adding an AND to this condition and checking that frame has to be bigger than say 10 before we can both die or stomp on the shell. This is doubly useful as it's important that we can't be killed by the shell right after it has been kicked anyhow. So here we go. Kick off the first shell. One jump. Two jumps. Ye oh, pants! It came back so fast. Still, that was looking good. Again, bounce, kick, bounce and kick. I just need to- oh no! Not again! Ha! <laughs> I'm not timing this so well. Oh seriously, why is it doing this to me? Oh well, it worked. We all saw it. Ha! <laughs> okay, only one thing left to do. To get these shells to kill the other enemies. But hold on, we have a problem. The shell is an enemy sprite clone, and the other enemies are… yeah also enemy sprite clones. The problem with this is that, firstly, try and add a touching block and look for the enemy sprite in the list. Nope, it's not there. Why? Because Scratch thinks we won't want to detect collisions with ourselves. Hmm, well actually we do, because we are using clones, right? Well, luckily this is easy to get round. We just create the sensing block in another sprite and set it to touching enemy, and then copy it over. Haha, job done. But that's not the end of our problems. We want only the enemies that are spinning shells to damage the other enemies, right? How can we find that out from a touching enemy block? It only tells us that we are touching an enemy, not the type of enemy or the other details about it. Well, this has been a problem us scratchers have had to suffer for as long as we've been scratching. There are many solutions of varying complexity and successfulness. The most obvious is to use lists and record positions of sprites in there, then use this to do the collisions instead mathematically. But well, I have a rather novel idea that avoids all of that which I think you will rather like. Before I tell you how we achieve it, because that in itself may not be obvious, let's take a look at the theory of what I want to do. We have many clones of the same enemy sprite. Some are deadly to other enemies, and some are not. What we want to do is have all the normal enemy clones be able to detect if they are touching any deadly ones. That is the goal here. If we use the sensing block from a normal enemy, it will report true if it's touching a deadly enemy. But it will also report true if it's touching another normal enemy too, and that's the problem. Now interestingly, the sensing block only detects sprites that are visible. And well, that makes sense, right? So if we were able to hide all the normal enemy sprites, then that would only leave the deadly ones to be detected. So far so good. The next step is to one by one make a normal enemy visible, and then ask if it's touching an enemy. If not, then we hide it again, and go on to the next. Now if one is touching another enemy, then it has to be a deadly collision since all the other normal enemies are still hidden. And then, before the game loop finishes, we quickly show all the enemies once more, so to the player of the game, they were not even aware that we were hiding things at all. So, have I sold this idea to you? Perhaps that seems pretty straightforward. But the next problem is, how on earth do we get Scratch to let us do this, all within a single screen tick? The reason it's hard is that we need great control over the order in which we hide clones, check for collisions, and then re-show them again. Luckily, as I've been teaching you on and off throughout these tutorials, we do already control the order of script execution in the main game loop. Here. As a recap, our main game loop, this forever loop, only contains broadcasts, no waits here at all, and as such the loop will repeat over and over 30 times a second. You can imagine that the player of your game will see the screen update once all the above broadcasts have had their chance to run. What is important is that the broadcast receivers through all the sprites of your project will run in the order that we broadcast them here. 
so all the when I receive check control scripts will run on all the sprites before the move player script will start. And these will run before the move enemy scripts, the move player after enemy, and finally the position tile scripts. It's only after these last scripts have had their turn that Scratch will refresh the screen to show where your sprites ended up. The magic of this is that, say in the move enemy script, we could hide the normal enemy sprites. But if we then show them again in the when I receive position tiles, then the player would not even see that we had hidden them. And importantly, when the move player after enemy script is running, none of the normal enemies will be visible, will they? Now isn't that something? So make sure we are looking at the enemy sprite. One small issue we have to address is that we don't keep track of which clones are visible on the screen. This is important to do so that we can restore things back to as they were intended when hiding and showing the enemies. As such, make a new variable naming it visible for this sprite only. Best to initialize it in the green flag script, so we'll set it to the empty value. Also, we need to find everywhere we did a show or hide and set this visible variable. Luckily, that wasn't so many places. Find the define set type script. Here's where we show the sprite when the game starts up. Set visible to one and throw away this worthless show block. Now notice that we are cloning this sprite here at the bottom. Well, to make things easier, let's then assume we can set visible back to the empty value after that, since the clone is the sprite that wants to be visible, not this one. Cool. The only other place we show the sprite is in the define tick life script. This is for making the life power up appear from behind the mystery block. Again, stuff in a set visible to one and remove the old show block. The reason we remove the show blocks is that making these visible here could cause the sprites to be mistaken for deadly clones and we don't want that. Well, if we give that a test we should find that no enemies are to be found. Ha! That makes for one easy Mario game, right? Serves them right for constantly killing me earlier. <laughs> okay, let's start at the end. We'll add in the script that will make all the enemy clones visible again. When I receive position tiles. This will let us test that the sprites will come back. If visible is greater than zero, then show. Only the clones with visible set to a number greater than zero will now be shown. So click the green flag. Yeah, the enemies strike back. I'm especially pleased to see that, oh man, uh, as I was saying, it's good to see the mushroom appearing correctly from behind the mystery block. Our next goal is to hide all non-deadly, normal enemies. And we were to do this in the when I receive move enemy script. But we want to ensure we hide it after it's done all its other work. The easiest way to ensure this happens is to split off all the scripts under the initial if check and make a new custom block, naming it move enemy. Run without screen refresh. Then all these scripts can go in there and we'll use this block right away there. And of course, we want to hide the sprite. But, and here is something we have not talked about. We only want to hide non-deadly enemies. How are we going to identify these? We could use the enemy type, but that would mean a lot of if checks. Instead, we will reuse this visible variable. A value of one means it's a normal visible sprite. And a two, will mean it's an always showing deadly sprite. So a, a rotating Cooper shell, for example. So only if visible equals one, a normal enemy, then hide it. That will leave the deadly enemies visible. Sweet. Let's test that to ensure it's all still hanging together. Right, so deadly enemies. Find the define tick shell script. Here is where we make the shell spin off in a given direction after it's been touched. So it's here we need to set visible to the new value of 2. It's now a deadly enemy. Conversely, when it is stomped on a second time, it stops moving, and we can set visible back to 1, restoring it to a normal enemy state. And now there's only the detection of collisions to code up. 
we are going to code this in a new when I receive move player after enemy block. Check first that we are not in the editor. Editor is less than one. And that this is a normal visible enemy. Visible equals one. Right, so this will be a hidden enemy at present, so we need to show it. Then we check for collisions using a touching enemy. Ah, problem. Scratch doesn't allow us to do that, does it? We must go into another sprite scripts, add the touching enemy block from there, and then drag it into the enemy sprite. The old touching block can be removed, and then click back into the enemy sprite and drop it into our if. Bit of a workaround, but hey. Right, perhaps we'll just delete this clone for the time being. That will be enough to show us that it's working. And then hide this enemy sprite again afterwards. This is really important. Otherwise, if left on the screen, other normal enemies will be able to see it and think that it's a deadly enemy. That would break our clever process. Ooh, wow, that should be it then. It's time to test. First, we need a Koopa. I select this one. Off goes the shell. Yes, it destroyed the Gumba and ticked off a Koopa too. Perfect. Now, just a check. I'll try placing a shell down here. And I'm seeing if Goomba can walk safely over it. Yeah, this is great. And now, boom, this shell is activated and the enemies stand no chance. No chance at all. And neither do I, sadly. All I want to do then before we end this episode is to give the dispatched enemies a better end animation. Luckily, we already have the required enemy flipping code. We use it when we headbutt a block under an enemy. Let's find the script. It's called define check flip. All we need is the bottom scripts here from the set speed y to 14. I'll make a new custom block flip and replace the scripts with this new block. Now, scroll back to our when I receive move player after enemy, bit of a mouthful, and replace the delete clone for the flip block. That's it. Run the project. Let's go. Okay, jump up here and kick the shell. Yeah, there we go. The Goombas flip upside down and the Koopa follows shortly after. Brilliant. That is working exactly as planned. Who would guess the tricks that we've put in place behind the scenes to get this working? I love it! Hmm, I wonder if we can kill off a piranha plant with one of these. Oh wow, yes we can! Ha! <laughs> Not sure it should work quite like that, or even look like that, but hey, it's pretty cool! <laughs> in Mario, there are further mechanics to these shells, like being able to pick them up and throw them. Also, not so difficult to add is that they should despawn when they go off screen. I bet you could figure that one out without me, right? Let me stick a load of gumbas in here. Go, go, Koopa Shell. Oh, yes, 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 that's awesome. <laughs> oh, wait, that reminds me. The shells are supposed to also collect coins as they move along. Oh, go on, we have time just for that. Click into the Mario sprite and find the define check around player at XY script. This is a simple script at present that just collects coins, so it is perfect for us. Just drag it into the enemy sprite. Then returning to the enemy sprite, I'll just tidy it up a bit and then find the define tick shell script. Scroll right to the bottom here and we'll drop in a check around player XY block checking at the enemy's x and y variables. We should just make sure we have the coin sound ready to play too. Back into the player sprite and in the sounds tab, copy the coin sound into the enemy sprite too. And that should be it. Run the project for the last time then. Here we go, jump on a Koopa and let that shell fly. It goes straight through the coins and even our coin counter goes up. Absolutely awesome. Well, I think we can have a lot of fun with this. We've covered some exciting new scripting ideas here and I hope they might open your minds to some amazing new Scratch project ideas. If it does, then drop me a comment and let me know all about it. This is the end of the video though. If you've enjoyed it, then smash the like button and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We're pushing ever onwards towards that 100,000 subscribers and you can be one of them. Plus, 
you'll then get notified as soon as my next video lands. If you want to support the channel further, then you can become one of my paid members who do get extra perks like priority replies in comments, early access to videos, and even the Scratch projects themselves. Wow! So thank you for watching, and until next time, Scratch on guys!